As children, we're told that the world is our oyster. We can be anything we want to be, do anything we want to do. The possibilities are truly infinite. But as we grow older, those possibilities, they just don't seem to be infinite anymore. As we grow up, we start to focus on limitations instead of opportunities. So how can we go back to that childlike mindset of endless possibilities? How do we pursue and achieve our most radical goals and dreams? Well, sometimes it starts with something as simple as a list. This is the Work Well podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today to talk about all things well-being. First, you just have to forget everything you think you know about a bucket list before we begin, because I think what happened was this journey really changed my core belief system and really I think sort of my DNA about what I believe is possible. I'm here with Ben Nimpton. Ben is a best-selling author and star of the show The Buried Life. He is an acclaimed speaker who has shared his message of radical possibility with audiences all over the world. I'll have to take you back to where I grew up in Victoria, BC, right, which is just off the coast of Vancouver. And I was in high school. I was just graduated from high school. I was going on to university and life was really good. Like I had a lot of things that I thought were really important going for me. So I was, I had a scholarship to university. I had a great circle of friends and family and I had worked really hard to make the U19 national rugby team, which, was a big deal in Canada because it's uh, it's sort of a big sport there, but on the West Coast, that's the epicenter of rugby Canada. And so I was training for the World Cup um, mm -hmm. and it was the U19 team that I was on. And I'd always put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed, and whether it be academically or um, you know with sport. And so as we got closer and closer to the World Cup, I started worrying about my field goals because I played fly half, so I was kicking field goals and I was also like calling the plays. And I had missed a big kick when I was in my last year of high school at a championship game and I didn't want that to happen again. And so I kept thinking, I can't miss an easy field goal at the World Cup. That would be like the worst thing I could ever do. And these thoughts continued to come uh, in my mind at night and it caused me to have trouble sleeping and, and this trouble sleeping got worse and I got more anxiety and I you know I was still putting a lot of pressure on myself and ultimately this lack of sleep this anxiety caused me to slide into a depression where I started having trouble making decisions so if I couldn't decide whether I should go to university uh, for a certain day I would ultimately not go because my decision would be my decision not to go and so I ultimately dropped out of school and I couldn't get myself to go to rugby practice, so I dropped, got dropped from mm. the national rugby team. And I became really a recluse and just kind of stayed in my parents' house. And for someone who was very social, had a ton of friends, and um, you know, sort of traditionally, quote unquote, was a high achiever, now I couldn't leave the house. And so I was, um, I really just was, going for a 15 minute walk every day, which sometimes I would just hide in the driveway and just pretend and tell my parents that I went for a walk. And so I was really crippled by this depression. And uh, it was a very scary time. And what happened was my friends ultimately came at the end of the semester that I had dropped out of and they kind of rallied me and corralled me, I guess is a better word, to come and work with them in a new town for the summer. and. I was sort of forced out of the house. I was forced to get a job. I was forced to connect with people. I was, you know, put in a new environment. And I started to get some confidence because I got a job. I started talking about what I was going through to my friends and realized that this wasn't a feeling that just I was having or, you know, that, that my friends had gone through something like this before. And there was comfort in that. And, um, and at the end of the summer, I was starting to feel back to myself. And it wasn't that easy, you know, like I wasn't just like I left home and then I was out of this sort of depression that I was in. There are many things that contributed that we can talk about later, but you know, effectively I came back and I thought, wow, I met all these really cool people in this new town. Um, and coming out of high school, I realized you can choose the people you surround yourself with. And uh, this one kid started a clothing line that I knew from high school. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. Like I wanna hang out with more people like that. So I decided to only surround myself with people that inspire me. 
And I called up this kid from the neighborhood named Johnny, who was a sort of filmmaker, self-taught filmmaker. And I, my friend had started this clothing line. And I thought, wow, if he did that, what could I do? I've always wanted to make a movie. Let's make a documentary. I'm going to call Johnny, who I don't really know. <laughs> he just took my sister to prom. That's all I knew about him. <laughs> and I said, Johnny, let's make a movie. And so we got another friend and Johnny's brother together into this sort of movie making mission. This was 2006. And Johnny at the time was at McGill and he got, he was in English class and he got assigned an old poem called The Buried Life. And The Buried mm -hmm. Life was a poem written in 1852 by a poet named Matthew Arnold, who effectively articulated what we were feeling, which was you have all these things that you want to do in your life, but they kind of get buried by the day to day. And sometimes you have moments when you're inspired, but that inspiration gets buried with just the sort of things you have to do with life, with work, with school. So we thought, yeah, that's exactly how we feel. But wait, this guy wrote this poem 150 years ago, so we're not the first person to feel like this, first people to feel like this, so why don't we call this movie that we're talking about The Buried Life? So we had the name, but we didn't know what it was gonna be about. And then we asked, um, okay, let's unbury our dreams, and how do we do that? And ironically, the thought, the thing that did that for us was death. <laughs> the thinking about the fact that we were mortal and our time was limited uh, made us think about life, and so, we asked ourselves the question, what do you want to do before you die? Because it made us think about the things that were really important to us. Mm -hmm. And there were many answers and, and the bucket list began from there. So the question spawned this list and and now we had this list of all of our biggest dreams and we, we pretended that anything was possible when we wrote the list. So we thought, okay, let's go after this list. Let's take a road trip. You know, Let's do whatever we can to hit the road, go after our list. And because this list is, some of these are outrageous dreams, we're gonna need the help of other people. So let's help other people cross things off their bucket list as well. So we'll do this road trip, we'll cross things off our list, and then everywhere we go, we'll ask people the same question, what do you wanna do before you die? And if we can help them, we will. And we'll do it for two weeks, and we'll make a movie, and we'll show it to our friends. <laughs> and so that was the mission. And so we begged, borrowed, and stole enough money till we could go uh, get an old RV, we bought a camera on eBay, we built a website with our 100 dreams, we pretended we had a production company and cold called companies. We got a juice company to pay for our gas. We got Red Bull to give us Red Bulls. We got a skate company to give us skateboards to give away. And we made matching t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we hit the road in this beater RV. And what happened was, you know, initially we didn't really tell anybody what we were doing because we thought it was a little bit self-serving to go after this list. And we didn't think anyone would understand. But as word started to spread, all these people came out of the woodwork and we started getting all these emails from people saying, hey, I saw your list of 100 things. I can help you with number nine, ride a bull, or I can help you you know, get up in a hot air balloon. Or Everyone wanted us to accomplish their, our dreams. And then they sent us their dreams, asking mm -hmm. for our help. So we got this, people pouring in, my dream is to, you know, sing a duet with Elton John. Can you guys help? My dream is to play Augusta or, you know, find my dad. And so all of a sudden we were overwhelmed with the response and it was national news and it was international news. And this two week road trip ultimately ended up lasting over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the list items that we put on the list initially that were, we were convinced were impossible that we kind of wrote just as a joke, you know, play basketball with President Obama, write a number one New York Times bestseller, make a TV show, have a beer with Prince Harry, sit with Oprah, you know, things that we really have no business doing. Over time, they happened. And so we sort of hit this point where we're like, wow, I guess you can do anything. <laughs> and ultimately, the funny thing was when we helped other people accomplish their dreams, it gave us more satisfaction than even accomplishing those mm -hmm. big audacious goals. So we learned some really interesting life lessons through this crazy road trip um, about life, about giving back, about purpose, about you know really achieving goals. But I think what happened was this journey really changed my core belief system and really I think sort of my DNA about what I believe is possible and I think what it did was it it shifted my perspective around if I look at something I don't think now can I do it I think do I want to do it because I know I can do it because you can do anything you want but but I also know it's going to take a whole lot of work so it's do 
I want to do this. And that's a, just a different way of looking at it. You know, I, I, I followed you and listened to some of the things that you talk about when it's when it comes to a bucket list. And I know many of the things on your list are big, audacious goals. Um, but you talk about bucket list in a different way, perhaps, than, than I've heard it before. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your philosophy around bucket list? Because I think it's, it's pretty inspiring. Yeah, I mean, first you just have to forget everything you think you know about a bucket list yeah. before we begin. Because the only definition that I adhere to is that a bucket list is a list of things that are going to bring you joy, happiness, and fulfillment. And I think our knee-jerk reaction is we gra- we think about adventure list items like travel or skydive or um, things that will kind of fill that small bucket. But if you if you open up your definition of what a list is, then there are really 12 or so categories of life that you should think about when you're writing your list. So whether that be emotional or spiritual, uh, physical, professional, material, right? It's okay to have material. You want, you want a mm-hmm. beautiful watch or a place on the beach, you know, um, giving back, how can you make an impact? Uh, so there's, there's all these different buckets of life that I think should be represented in your list. And, so that's the first thing. It, it can be anything. It could be spending Friday night with your kids. You know, it could be um, hiking Everest. Like it, it, the, all, both of those are equally important as long as they're important to you. I always shied away from a bucket list. I, we always call, just call it a list. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the bucket list is just a universally known term it's for it. It's a list so, of answering the question of what I want to do before I die. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so once you sort of have that, then you sort of look at, okay, what is the purpose of a, of a bucket list? Like why even have one? Well, the purpose is that you need a reminder that your goals and dreams exist. Because if you don't have a, any, a device that reminds you that your personal goals exist, they get buried. That's mm-hmm. why the poem was written. This is human nature. This has been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. The purpose of a list is really to help you not have regrets at the end of your life. So if you really step back and, and I think about, okay, why am I doing this? My goal is to bring down the high percentage of people that get to the end of their life and their biggest regret is not living their ideal self, right? Mm-hmm. So n- living a life for someone else, not themselves. And that can happen subconsciously or that can happen consciously. Um, we think in the short term, it's not important, right? We think- Because we have a long time to get it done. We have our whole you got, life. You got a whole life. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll do it next week. You'll do it next year. You have all the time in the world. Well, 76% of people do that and they realize on their deathbed that it's too late. And so- this comes from research from a psychologist named Tom Gilovich, who did a study called The Ideal Road Not Taken, published in the uh, journal Emotion. And he found that 76% of people, uh, their number one regret in their entire life when they're on their deathbed is not living my ideal self. Mm. So people die with re- regretting the things they didn't do. They don't regret the things they did. And so, you know, how do we get more people into that bucket of the 24%? How do we increase that percentage of the people that die thinking, yeah, I I did these things that I really wanted to do and I feel good about my life. You know, I I can't uh, uh, imagine getting to the end of my life and having that big regret. And so in order to be really successful at work, you need to be really successful in your personal life. I mean, Mm -hmm. there's just no line between work and life. I find it fascinating that at at a young age, you were college age, you and your friends were thinking about death. Where where do you think that that came from? Because I would say for myself, I know at that age I wasn't thinking about death. As a matter of fact, I thought I was invincible and you know I was going to live forever. Um, and so I'm fascinated by the fact that you all kind of came to this like, what do we want to do before we die? And and I think it's a brilliant concept. But do you, any insights on kind of what led you there? So. One of the guys, Duncan, who's the oldest, he went for a camping trip with his friends. And this is about the time we started The Buried Life. And one of his good friends accidentally drowned. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time that he had really experienced death personally. And us by one degree of separation as well. And so that was one uh, instigator. And the, the other was that we just wanted something that was actually going to shake us. 
And that was the only thing that we could think of that would get our attention and would get the attention of our friends. And we liked that it was taboo. Mm -hmm. We liked that people didn't talk about it. And that it was, if we go up to a stranger on the street and we say, hey, do you mind if we ask you a question? What do you want to do before you die? That they're sort of taken aback. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it did was it planted a seed and ultimately what would happen is if we asked people on the street, what do you want to do before you die? If they didn't know what they wanted to do, they would come back to us, run us down the street and say, hey, you know what? I, actually, it's this. Like I want to write a book um, because this, this, this. And so, yeah, we just, we liked how it just got straight to the point mm -hmm. in a world where we thought it, everyone was sort of being very, you know, we just felt like we were walking through a fog. Mm -hmm. Everybody was buried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned your struggle with mental health. Um, how has that shaped your journey and, and the message that you share with your audiences now? I think it's shaped, I mean, the reason I started speaking was because I started really learning about the suicide epidemic and I thought that I had an obligation to tell my story openly and honestly so that it might help other people that feel the same way. So. I started speaking, you know, two, three years ago, uh, and it wasn't an easy thing to do to open up about like this story I just told you about. Uh, but I, I had a feeling that I, I was ready to do it, and that was really the most important thing. I, I knew it wasn't gonna be comfortable, but I was in a place where I felt that fundamentally I was okay to, to talk about it publicly with people that I didn't know and care about. And so I did, and it was really scary and I was shaking and it got easier and easier. And now it's not, I love talking about it because mm -hmm. I can see the effect it has on people real time. I, I can actually feel that it's impacting people when I open up about it. And that afterwards when I talk with people, you know, it's something that really resonates with them. And so I think that I guess how I've evolved my the, the, the speaking is that now I really also like to talk about resources and tools that I use to help myself pick myself up when I feel down or get myself through a tricky situation. All right, so let's kind of switch gears a little bit here. Um, I wanna talk about when we don't achieve our goals and what happens when you fail. I don't wanna be cliche, but I just think failure is great. You know, I, I think that usually what failure is, is a pivot in the right direction. So it forces you to recalibrate and then you move on. It's, it's really, by putting yourself in that vulnerable position, you, um, something good will happen. From, anytime I've put myself into a situation where I'm scared, just out of my mind, whether it's like going in a crump battle in, in Compton yeah. or surviving on a deserted island in the Cook Islands or you know, <laughs> giving a commencement speech in front of 15,000 people, I, uh, as soon as I uh, am approached with the opportunity, I immediately say to myself, no way, no way I'm doing it, right? Like, there's, why? There's no way. And then a little voice inside me goes, well, you know, that's why you have to do it. Yeah. And then I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. But something good will come out of it. I'll give you an example. Like, I know that you want to do a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that now so that you are accountable. So now it's on, rec it's now recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> I got approached to do a TEDx talk and immediately I thought, no way. Like, it's, uh, it's a lot of pressure and I'm going to have to prepare and I don't have time. And so I almost wrote back no. And then I listened, I, get, I put it off and I listened to that inner voice that was like, oh, you know, you really should do this, Ben. And I, I like, agree. Yeah, and so, <laughs> and so I did it. And that was 2015, it was the first time I'd ever spoken mm -hmm. on my own and it was the first time I'd ever given any type of like actual takeaway that I thought was important. Uh, and then someone saw the TEDx talk and invited me to speak in Minnesota. It's a random speaking engagement, 2018 or it's 2017, 18. And, and that sparked this sort of word of mouth that got around that I, was in getting invited to speak and it changed my complete direction in my life where now you know, I'm speaking 100 plus times a year. Mm -hmm. So I sh very easily on almost replied to that email, thank you, but I'm completely booked up that week. I'm sorry, but uh, keep me in mind for next year. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't, and I put myself out there and 
amazing stuff happened. And that's what I think happens when you get over that fear of really like, what is the fear when you unwind it and, and unpack it? It's just usually the fear of what other people think or the fear of failure. And both of those fears, assuming you have your basic needs met are sort of made up fears but they're ingrained in us from generations of people having these fears. By the way, from very uh, real life or death uh, ex uh, situations, right? So the fear of what other people think is, dates back to when we were hunter gatherers and if we went out for a hunt and we came back without a kill, then we were at risk of getting kicked out of the tribe. If we did something wrong in the tribe, you got kicked out, you died. Mm -hmm. So that has been passed on till now where we still have the fear, but the risk is is not real. So I'm not saying that the fear isn't real because I feel it, everyone feels it, it's real feeling, but the the risk is not as real as we think. And so it's it, it's it's just, you know, it, it's not as uh, catastrophic as you think. And ultimately, people are just thinking about you much less than you think they are, right? So that's the other thing. Right. <laughs> uh, so that's that's the fear of failure and the, the fear of, of whether people think, sorry, and the fear of failure is, um, is again, like if you're afraid to go after your goal, or you're waiting for the right time, you know, you, you failed. So what, when you try and fail, then you learn something. Interesting, so how do you motivate yourself in, in to, you know, I think a lot of people have these goals, but they're kind of waiting for the right time, as you put it, or kind of waiting for the right motivation or waiting to be inspired um, in order to go out and finally do something about their goal. Small steps of action, writing it down. All of a sudden your goals exist. They're not just a thought. You so know, that's the list. You have your list, yeah. <laughs> so now you're 42% more likely to achieve them. Sharing your goals, talk about them, then people can help you, but then you also feel accountable. So we wanna create accountability around personal goals so that we can drive ourselves forward. Just like we have accountability at work and that works. Mm -hmm. uh, so you wanna write them down, you wanna share them. I think when you're, when you're thinking about sharing your goals, it's important to also uh, consider that you wanna be intentional with your sharing. So if you wanna write a book, ask people if they know an author and say, hey, oh, your uncle wrote a book, I saw that. Do you, do you mind if you introduce me to him and I can borrow 15 minutes of the time? I just wanna know, how do you get an agent? Or how do you write a book proposal? And maybe they become a mentor. So you can be intentional with your outreach and just ask for help. Everyone that is up at the top at some point, for the most part, was in your position at some point. And they remember someone helping them. So you wanna to continue to try and reach out intentionally to people that might be able to help and then, if you want to increase your odds to 77% more likely to achieve your goal, you have an accountability buddy or a friend, someone checking in on you down the line, uh, ideally with some sort of consequence if you don't. Let's talk about your 100 goals. What, what are some of the most memorable goals that, that you've accomplished to date? Or maybe better, a better question is the goals that you've helped others accomplish, because I know that you've said that those those have been the most rewarding. Yeah, I think that there's, I'll do one for each. Okay. So the one on our list, I think would be, the most meaningful was playing basketball with President Obama <laughs> at the White House because it was such a outrageous goal for us to have. I thought, I, mean, I remember writing it down and laughing and just thinking, this is absurd. Like, why are we even, okay, sure, we'll write it down. <laughs> And three years later, we're at the White House basketball courts and President Obama surprised us on the court. So going from that place to actually accomplishing it really was the straw that broke the camel's back in my mind when I thought, wow, I, I guess anything's possible. And so that's why it's most meaningful because it really shifted, you know, after a couple of those big dominoes fell of those bigger list items leading up to that with like maybe the TV show or some of the other things. President Obama was the sort of ultimate moonshot and it really shifted uh, my core belief system. And the most meaningful uh, help that I think we've done is, if I guess I'll say for me personally, perhaps was the first person that we helped because that shifted, I think, the direction of the project. When in 2006, we met a guy named Brent who emailed us and said my dream and it was sort of he had written us in the English it was 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 not correct grammar and it was we thought he said I want to bring pizzas down to the homeless shelter and we said okay well let's go meet this guy and we meet him and 
we learn quickly that he had lived in this homeless shelter mm -hmm. and he wanted to bring in food because he said when people came in with food, when he lived there, it felt like it was a great day because someone cared about him. And so he had pulled himself out of that homeless shelter by starting a landscaping business and this landscaping business relied on his truck and his truck had broken down. When we even asked him if we could help, he wouldn't mention this sort of situation that he was in where his whole business was in peril. He'd always bring it back to bring the pizzas to the homeless shelter. And so we, um, we ended up uh, pooling our money, which was about $480 Canadian. <laughs> and a used car salesman gave us a $2,100 truck for $480. Yeah. And we drove it up to Brent, we tossed him the keys. And the moment he saw the truck, he just immediately like bear hugged me and started to cry and just held on for a long time. And that moment was changed I th just what we thought about in terms of like what we knew was important and like the real heart of this project, which was helping other people. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of when we decided, okay, we gotta keep doing this. So are there big goals on your list that you haven't accomplished yet? I think you said you've accomplished 91 of the 100, so what's holding you back? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, come on. Come on, slacker. <laughs> yes, we have, so the, there's been a lot of uh, list items that I've added to uh, change the list items off, you know, as you grow your list changes. But this 100 is kind of the original 100. We've done 91 of, of, of that uh, initial 100. The two that I would love to cross off and that we're kind of actively working on right now, number 91, which is make a movie. Mm -hmm. So I just, this, this film that we started in 2006 that we thought would take two weeks to finish and we show to our friends is not done, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've shot a thousand hours of footage and you've seen this whole story over 10 years plus years uh, and like all different types of footage and it's just like a really cool medium and so we want to finish that by crossing off number 100 which is go to space mm -hmm. <laughs> and go to space is a tricky one to figure out but we are working on it so that is uh the, those are the two big ones left and even though that scares you, you're probably going to say yes, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. Because that's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> are we recording that? <laughs> <laughs> we are, because I'm going to hold you accountable. <laughs> yeah. So, Ben, circling back to the beginning of your story, I'd love to know if you ever went back to kick that goal. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So, what I realized about that initial time when I went through that hard time and when I was playing rugby and I was, you know, putting a lot of pressure on myself as I reflect, I realize I actually didn't really like rugby that much. <laughs> and as I've thought about times in my life where I've hit lows, I started to understand that, okay, I'm probably doing something in my life right now that is making me unhappy. And with rugby, I was I did it because it was cool. Like I did it because that's what everybody did. You know, it's like football in the South, like that was the thing to do but I didn't love it. And so I, what, I, what the consequence was is that I was suppressing uh, my creative expression. And what I've learned is that creativity as an outlet is something that I need to do to be operating at my full potential. And so I was suppressing that because I didn't have time to do it. And then buried life became my creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And I hit that again recently, three years ago when I was running our production company that we started. I wasn't able to be creative and I ended up deciding to not do that anymore. And, and that's when I pivoted into speaking. And now speaking is my creative outlet, podcast, content, all that stuff. So I just learned throughout, you know, this as I was growing up that uh, sometimes when, when I felt depressed, it was because it was what I was doing. Mm -hmm. it, you know, in hindsight, this, this, decision to be more intentional about the people that I surround myself and trying to surround myself with people that give me energy versus take energy was the thing that changed my trajectory. And it's, it's easier said than done because sometimes the, it's complicated. You can't just leave people that are, um, whether they're, they might be family or really close friends that may not be giving you energy. And, and that's uh, okay, I, I understand that you can't just sort of 
take a left turn and you're gone forever, right? You know, you don't want to do that, but you can be aware that they are sort of taking that energy consistently and build your own sort of barriers around that and just be aware of that. It's just the awareness. But the thing that you can absolutely do is you can find people Mm -hmm. in your life that really inspire you, give you energy and hang out with them more and hang out with their friends more. Because once you start to change your circles of your tribe, then you just by osmosis, you start to believe in yourself a little more. You start to think that more things are possible because you see your friends doing things that are amazing and you know that they're no different than you. And so you think, wow, they just did that. That's so cool. I wonder what I can do. And that was the real change for me. And that is really about like when you do what you love, you inspire other people to do what they love and that creates a ripple. And so when my friend who I didn't know very well started a clothing line, I went to him. I said, hey, this is so awesome. I don't think I can be of any service here, but is there anything I can do to help? He said, well, you know, you could like try and get us some press. And I was able to get the clothing line in a big cool hunting blog. And I thought, wow, that was really easy. Uh, he did that, what should I do? And so just, you know, if you can gravitate towards people that in- inspire you in your life, that really fire you up, that can have an amazing impact. It's the, the old adage that you become most like the five people you surround yourself with. Yep. yep. So Ben, is there anything else you wanna leave our listeners with before we close? I would love if people could do two things at, at the end of this podcast. One is take 20 minutes to sit somewhere quiet and write your list and just think about anything that you've ever wanted to do. Think about all the different categories of your life and just stream of consciousness, write your your list. And then now that you've written it and it's real, uh, take a photo of it and if you don't have an accountability buddy, I'll be your accountability buddy. Love it. And you can share it with me. Take you know, tag me on Instagram or Twitter, which is at Ben Nempton, which is just my full name. And that's just a great way to also share it with your community. So you'll then feel even more accountable because you posted it. So I think those two things are just simple ways you can sort of build inspiration through action and start to build accountability that's awesome well i'll i'll be the first one to take you up on that i'm so grateful ben could be with us today thank you to our producers and our listeners You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. And don't forget to send us your list.